Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Amanda Blair McDonald. She is a movement educator based in Chicago, Illinois. She's been a certified Alexander Technique teacher since 2006, and she recently became a certified movement pattern analyst. And the reason we're doing this podcast is uh, Amanda gave a TED Talk recently, and I'll put a link to that by the interview, that uh, really impressed me in terms of how poised she was on stage and how she really engaged the audience. And I thought it would be interesting to talk to her about the various modalities that she uses and how she can how she combines them how they can usefully supplement each other so amanda welcome to the show thank you so much well it's a pleasure talking to you and i guess we should start with you providing our audience with short descriptions or definitions of these three things which are first of all the alexander technique secondly movement pattern analysis and then developmental movement. So Fantastic. All right. So Alexander Technique is a uh, modality that looks at habit and choice, how we respond to stimuli in our environment, and how becoming more aware of that response can give us more choice over whether we pursue our habits or whether we uh, have a choice to create something new. And it is very often taught uh, in a hands-on modality or at least using some movement because the body can serve as a, uh, a window into understanding that. Um, it's often called psychophysical re-education uh, because we are including our whole self and not just body or mind as separate pieces. Yeah, excellent. I like that. <laughs> uh, now, movement, pattern, and now analysis. Movement, pattern, analysis is a framework for understanding human action and interaction um, using vocabulary created by Rudolf Laban, that can describe all forms of human movement. And by observing human movement over time, we can get a window into the cognitive decision-making processes of each person. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that I, as an analyst, would interview someone for two hours and video that interview and then go back and analyze all the movements and then use that analysis to create a report um, talking to the person about what preferences show up in their movement. Uh -huh. and, and if certain preferences show up, that might be something that a person would deliberately emphasize or perhaps deliberately try to um, upgrade the things that are not their preferences. Is that how it would be would play out um sort of yes the one of the things that have has been learned by researching uh movement pattern analysis is that our cognitive preferences remain fairly stable once we become adults so we're not going to change from being somebody who really loves research to somebody who would really spend like to spend more time actually in action mm -hmm. Um, but we do uh, have a possibility to, to sort of slide on a spectrum within our preferences. Um, and, and we also, if we know that research is our preference and we would rather spend most of our time doing that, then perhaps we should seek support from other people when it comes to making a commitment and taking action. Oh, so you'd know what to outsource, basically. Exactly. Yeah, excellent. So that we're okay. not forcing ourselves to become somebody that we aren't. We're just recognizing where our strengths lie and where our weaknesses lie. 
Okay. And then developmental movement. Developmental movement is sort of a large category. I specifically use something called the brain dance, which is a developmental sequence of movement in the order of when we were born. And the theory behind using this sequence is that by repeating movements in this sequence, we can um, uh, uh, rewire and re-regulate ourselves sharpen our senses, wake ourselves up to help ourselves feel better, become more awake, become more alert and ready to learn. And I believe you said that that, that uh, process, the brain dance, is what you used at the beginning of your TED Talk. Is that correct? Yes, it is. It's because, absolutely because what Because what was very impressive to me is how quickly you were able to engage the audience in in the process you were sh talking them through it was a fairly simple process but yes. you you it seemed like everyone was on board quite quickly and i i think to myself well you know if i'm teaching a workshop and i want to introduce the alexander technique in some way i i really want something that would get people engaged right at the beginning and you certainly did that uh yes, with the ted you. talk so I did that on purpose. Mm -hmm. I knew that the people in the audience would have been sitting there through several talks before I came on stage. Oh, okay, good. And yeah. I was going to be bringing a lot of really dense information, and I wanted them to be refreshed and awake and ready to take in that information. Mm -hmm. And I also, knowing that I had 17 minutes of talking to do, I wanted to make sure that I was calm and grounded and ready to go and not um, not letting my nerves or excitement uh, get in the way of delivering that material. So I knew that if I was doing the brain dance on the stage in front of them and breathing, that by the time we got finished with it, I would have gotten myself centered on the stage and I'd be able to approach the talk from a very calm place. And I'm guessing that if you were not centered on stage, um, your talk would have been way, way less effective. I think you're right. In terms of reaching people. Yes. Because their their eyes, of course, and ears were all on you. And yes. they were picking up your, at some level, I imagine your internal vibes, right? Yes. <laughs> and so you had to really model what you were talking about, which is a little more than many, say, TED speakers have to do. I mean, they're usually fairly charismatic people, but often they're talking about something that's not involving the human body and movement. They're talking about some bigger, some other sort of question. But you yes. were really talking, in a sense, about yourself a little bit. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. That's, Absolutely. Uh, so you you work with all three of these modalities. Um, how uh, how do you find that they they help each other or reinforce each other? Uh, is uh, maybe that would be a good place to start? How do they relate to each other in your experience? In my experience, Alexander Technique is at the base of everything that I do. Mm -hmm. The ability to pause mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before I act and the understanding of the, the, the way our design, you know, our, our, our design is meant to work. Mm -hmm. and the inner expansiveness of the whole system and the freedom of the whole system, to me that underlies everything else that I do. Mm -hmm. So that is always at the, at the foundation in anything that, not only that I do myself, but in anything that I teach. Um, right. Right. And then as I have learned more in other areas of movement, they have given me ideas about how to talk about Alexander Technique in more ways, but also uh, bring Alexander Technique into those modalities. Mm -hmm. 
So, for example, both the brain dance and MPA use movement vocabulary that was created by Rudolf Laban. And I have found that vocabulary very helpful in my Alexander work. For example, one of the areas of vocabulary in Laban talks about pressure. And sometimes people will call pressure strong pressure and light pressure, but you can also talk about it as a spectrum of increasing pressure and decreasing pressure. And this is pressure, say what you mean by pressure a little bit. So this would be internal muscular pressure. Okay. So as an Alexander teacher, one of the things that I talk with students, especially new students who are coming to me the, for the first time, I talk with them about uh, the idea that we very often bring with us in everything that we do internal muscular pressure that gets in the way of our free and easy movement and breathing. Right. And right. we often have been squeezing ourselves for so long that we're not even aware that we're doing it anymore. Right, right. Yeah. And in order to feel what it is to be light, I as an Alexander Technique teacher have to find a way to help them experience the lightness so that then they can notice when they're getting tight. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes... Uh, what I'll do is I will say, okay, you know, uh, clench your, your, your hands into a fist and increase the pressure in your hands and your arms and then let it go. And we'll do this several times, increasing pressure and decreasing pressure until they can feel it in a muscle that's readily easy, easily, easy for them to feel. Mm -hmm. And then I'll talk about that that happens in all of our muscles only some muscles have more nerve innervation for us to feel them and some muscles don't or they don't have as much they're not as easy to feel and that by talking about pressure on a spectrum I give them a place and they can start working wherever they are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it also I can then later talk about um, the fact that taking Alexander lessons doesn't mean that you have to walk through your whole life as light as possible all the time. That different tasks require different amounts of pressure, different amounts of effort. And so the important thing is to um, always be looking for the appropriate amount of effort. You know, if I'm going to lift a heavy box, I'm going to need more effort and more pressure in my muscles than in, if I'm just standing holding a cup of coffee. Right, right. And that, and that helps get them out of the mindset of there's a right way to move and moves them over to a mindset of what helps me feel ease, what helps me use an appropriate amount of effort so that I'm not overdoing it and wearing myself out from the inside. And as part of that teaching people or showing people that there are different efforts appropriate efforts for, for different tasks, do you then use these other two modalities to, to do that? Do you have them move in a certain way just as, just as a way for them to learn about that pressure in themselves? I do. I, I do either the whole brain dance or segments of the brain dance with all of my Alexander students. I use a variety of, um, spiraling movements. I use, uh, I sometimes will use movements from Tai Chi or other martial arts mm -hmm. as a way to explore movement and explore pressure and effort within that movement um, to help them become aware and also to give them something to do when they're away from their lesson that they can practice and explore on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, and um, so what, what, what would you say to pr people who have 
specialized a little more narrowly, who, for example, are Alexander teachers but don't really know a lot about these other two methods, or people who've put in a lot of time studying one or one of these other two methods but don't know about the others. What would you say is the advantage in at least learning something about the others? The, the first thing is the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. The learning the range of vocabulary from the Laban system mm -hmm. has really improved my observation skills. It has improved my understanding of what I'm seeing. And so much of the time, Things don't exist in our consciousness until they are named. Mm -hmm. so, Once we so for, name them, we understand them more deeply. So, for example, if you were observing a student doing either one of the more specialized activities that you might have them do, or even something as simple as walking or getting out of a chair or whatever, because you have that vocabulary, you, it enables you to see, have a better, a better ability to identify um, the quality of what I guess Alexander teachers would call use, good use. Good use, You, you have yes. a, a better, it gives you a, a way of seeing that perhaps a little more clearly. Yes, and of naming it and discussing it with my students. Right, right. And I really am very verbal with my students. You know, I know that Alexander teachers have a very wide range of ways that they like to approach that their their students and talk about what they're doing. And and I'm very verbal and very um, what upfront with what I'm seeing, so that. Mm -hmm. I can help my students have more agency over themselves when they're away from me. Um, and so this vocabulary has very much helped that for me. How about people in those other two fields who aren't familiar with the Alexander technique? What might they gain by uh, getting some exposure to it? In, in terms of developmental movement, um, for me, developmental movement and the brain dance are part of teaching dance classes to a wide variety of populations. And I feel very strongly that exposure to Alexander technique is, I, I wish every dance teacher could have it. And mm -hmm. I am currently um, working at an organization where they're letting me come in and train teaching artists and one of the things I do is share information with them from Alexander Technique because it changes the quality of the way they talk about movement to their students. Mm -hmm. it, it changes what they expect of their students in the movement. Um, I, I recently did a two-day teacher training up in Wisconsin for people who want to teach dance to people living with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And I spent the whole first morning talking about Alexander technique for Parkinson's first mm -hmm. so that they could then take those tools into their dance teaching so that in the process of dance teaching, they're not increasing pressure or pulling people with Parkinson's down more, they're actually giving them tools to free up and enjoy the dancing more. So, so I'm very passionate about spreading Alexander Technique to people in the movement world. You know, years and years ago, I had a very good friend who loved to take dance classes. She was always going to dance classes wherever she lived. She just loved to dance, and she loved to go to love to watch dancers. But she she was not very a very talented dancer. She knew that that wasn't she wasn't <laughs> didn't didn't have any professional aspirations at all. And what 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 I noticed happened to her was that she was constantly injuring herself. Hmm. 
And I, I just wonder if she had had access to a dance class of the kind you teach, where a, a, attention was paid to quality of movement and more, even more than it might be in a regular dance class. Like, n not just the movements, but how you organize yourself to do the movements. Absolutely. That she, she might have been a lot better off. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think uh, dance classes in general and technique classes specifically are the ultimate in end gaining. Uh -huh. We're going for a shape, a look, uh, making our body look somehow like the either the teacher is demonstrating or the teacher is asking for. And we are so set on that goal that we don't always take care of ourselves in the process of meeting the goal. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so absolutely, I feel like if dance teachers had these tools and were able to pass them on to their students, a lot of injuries could be av avoided. And I think that a lot more people would dance more often. Yeah, yeah. She had to give. Because it would feel good. <laughs> yeah, my friend, my friend had to give it up eventually. She just couldn't yeah. do it anymore. Um, well, and one of the things um, that 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 has happened for me in the world of dance is that I come from musical theater world, which is very much traditional technique based. You do ballet, jazz, and tap, and you do what the teacher tells you. Mm -hmm. And I have now moved into a world that's more influenced by modern dance and postmodern dance that invites a lot of improvisation um, and a lot of movement that feels more natural and organic and expands the idea of what dance is for me. Mm -hmm. dance, a dance class doesn't have to be stand at the bar and do a tendu. A right, dance class right. can, can incorporate a lot more movement where you can explore your own freedom and the ebb and flow of effort and pressure, and you can have periods of recuperation. And I think, you know, one of the reasons people tend to give up dance as they get older is because they think that they have a very narrow view of what dance is. Oh, I can't take ballet anymore. I guess I can't dance. Well, what if you move from ballet into a modality that allows for a lot more freedom and doesn't require you to stand in a particular shape? That right, right. openness allows the aging body to still be a dancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just looks a little different. Yeah, exactly. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we we bring this podcast to an end that we haven't covered? Well, I think we haven't talked about movement pattern analysis as much. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is because I've been teaching Alexander Technique and dance for much longer than mm -hmm. I've been doing MPA. And still, so I'm still learning how they inform each other. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I think is really fascinating about MPA is that it has a similar approach to Alexander Technique in that in both of these modalities, we are not saying change yourself and be something else. We're saying, let's just stop for a moment and take a look at who we are what's happening right now and can we look at it and be curious about it instead of jumping in to fix it right yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's very alexandrian it's very yeah. alexandrian but it's also mpa uh -huh. mpa says that our cognitive proce uh, processes and preferences are fairly stable in adulthood uh, barring some major trauma or illness and so in MPA, when we go in and, and analyze someone and give them a report on what we discovered about them, we're not saying, okay, now go change. We're saying, here's who you are, so now that you're aware of it, you can have some choice over how you respond to it. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, this is a huge gift. Yeah. That yeah. in this world... 
where, you know, we're told to do, 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 achieve, 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 you know, bend yourself backwards trying to become. Here's this very sort of Western version of mindfulness and self-acceptance and then using that information to make choices that support who you are instead of twisting you to become something that you're not. And then, so that's a much larger conversation, but this is part of what's so inspiring to me about this work. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it sounds like from, from the way you describe all three of these, that all three of them um, are kind of based on the assumption that our structure is just perfect for living on earth. <laughs> I mean, we could, you couldn't have a better structure uh, enabling you to stand up on two little feet and then move around <laughs> and all that stuff. Uh, yes. it, it's, we're perfectly designed to be here, but um, like a fine racing car, you know, we can get out of balance. You know, it's you gotta be, we got to be tuned properly to take advantage of that structure. And it sounds like all three of these, in a way, are, are ways of doing that. Yes, I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah, maybe this maybe this is where we should end the podcast. What do you think? <laughs> that sounds great. Okay, thank well, you so much, Robert. I well, really have enjoyed talking with you. Well, thank you. I want to just say once again, my uh, guest today has been Amanda Blair McDonald. She's a movement educator in Chicago. She's an Alexander teacher. She's a movement pattern pattern analyst, and she also has studied developmental movement. I'll be putting a link to her website by the interview if you want to get in touch with her. You can do it that way. I'll also put a link to her the TED Talk that inspired this uh, podcast, which I uh, highly urge, urge you to look at uh, because she's demonstrating exactly what she's talking about, and it's a pretty impressive talk. And also, I'll put a link to, um, because this is an Alexander Technique podcast, I'll put a link to a website that will tell you more about the Alexander Technique and how to find a teacher in your area. Amanda, thank you so much for this. This has been fascinating. Thank you, Robert.